So this event, welcome to design.agency, some wise words on design and aging. I'm gonna hand over to our panelists in a moment and they are Colin Lowe, the director of the Design Agent Institute, George Lee, who's the co-founder of This Age Thing, and our special guest speaker today, Patricia Moore, fellow of the Industrial Designers Society of America. So very exciting and over to you, Colin. Um, so welcome to everybody uh, to the to the Wisdom Hour Design Agency with Patty Moore, George Lee, and myself. Um, as you may have guessed, this is not a formal one-hour slot of Zoom presentations full of research and statistics. It's an informal fireside chat discussing how designers can use the wisdom that comes with age to tackle as aspects of ageism um, experienced in society and how design can help us all live longer, healthier, happier lives. We are very lucky uh, to be joined by two heavyweights in the design and healthy aging space. Um, so first of all, or for the few of you who do not know who Patty Moore is, here is a very brief summary. Um, ID Magazine selected Patty as one of the 40 most socially conscious designers in the world. In 2000, ABC News featured Patty as one of the 50 Americans defining the new millennium. And in 2016, she was named one of the most notable American industrial designers in the history of the field. Patty began her career uh, working with Raymond Lowy International in New York in 1974. But it was in 1979, at the age of 26, that Patty began an exceptional and daring sociological experiment uh, to study um, the lifestyles of elders in North America. Uh, and that went on to define a lot of the rest of her career. She traveled throughout the United States and Canada, um, prosthetically disguised and restricted as an elderly woman around 85 years of age. Uh, the research was completed in 1982 after visiting 116 cities in 14 states and two Canadian provinces. Uh, the outcome of this experience was the publication in 1985 of the book, Disguised a True Story. Um, Patty now owns Moore Design Associates in Phoenix, Arizona, specializing in developing new products and services for the lifespan needs of consumers of all ages and abilities. Uh, so if you're not intimidated by that, then you really haven't been paying much attention. I would also like to welcome George Lee, a highly respected disruptor and innovator in the Philippines, <laughs> leading the way in showing how cross-generational innovation is central and social, uh, central to social and economic impact. In 2016, Creative Review voted George as one of the top 50 creative leaders in the world. She is co-founder of the pioneering social enterprise, The Age of No Retirement, championing a society where age doesn't define people before uh, and before that was co-founder and director of the multi award design studio this is real art in 2020 george set up specialist design research consultancy the common land to help businesses understand the outdated and economically limiting conventions of age and in, and in 2021 with the age the design age institute us uh, we launched this age thing bringing together healthy aging champions from all sectors to create real change and action so Without, I thought we can take the slides down now uh, and start our, our, our chat. Um, so it's just a question, bunch of questions and answers, really, uh, for George and, and, and Patty. And I think I'd like to start, if, if I could. Um, we often say we are all ageing, um, but as we all creep slowly towards uh, 85, the age that you, you did your research, um, you know, the age that you imitated, should I say, what do you think uh, will be different now than, than happened? So, Patty, to you, what do you think will be different when you actually hit 85 compared to what it was like when you were pretending to be 85? Well, certainly the technology piece will be in, in full play. Um, I live in a rather stupid house and, and it's, it's quite deliberate. I, I think on one hand, I'm always doing experimentation and especially with myself as subject. Uh, I don't have much technology. I have nothing smart around me really other than this device and um, my, my phone. Um, I don't even have a doorbell. So that tells you what sort of dinosaur I am. And, and it's, it's quite deliberate. That said, I'm about to enter my 70th year and I'm quite aware of the marvels of science and technology and how they define my health, my wellness, my well being, and the potentiality of, of how I will stay healthy as, as healthy as possible as I age, hopefully in place, which is to say, I hope to stay in this home. I hope to, um, you know, 
live here and die with my boots on. And I also know that the probability of that is 50-50, quite <laughs> frankly. Uh, I'm, I'm currently finishing up a project at Arizona State University looking at the connection between design and dementia. And dementia is a tsunami, a global tsunami in the wait. Um, once we get through this pandemic, maybe we'll start to realize this is the one that should be scaring us all. We should be shaking in our boots on this because we're not at all prepared. Just as we saw with the pandemic globally, we weren't prepared. We're not prepared for the next pandemic and we're not prepared to meet the needs of all people who have loved ones that will develop a dementia at the end of life. And um, I'm one of those people. I have no children. I currently live alone. So I know my lifestyle is going to change dramatically based on my level of health. And I look forward to those technologies that the point I made at the very start, um, those technologies will give me a good day versus a questionable day. And, and do you think, you know, is technology uh, better or worse designed today than say public transport was 40 years ago? Well, having designed the light rail uh, vehicle for Phoenix, I'm rather sure that it's brilliant and uh, made a huge difference as we know it has. Um, the state of Arizona is a bit of an interesting um, subject arena. There wasn't a lot of support for mass transit here when I came. I was told to get my blankety blank self back to New York City <laughs> where I belonged. Um, but I felt uh, honored to be working on the system because it is the it is the great equalizer now. Mm. Plus, um, we don't need each of us a car and, and this carbon footprint that's so out of control. Mm -hmm. Every time I talk to Al Gore, I'm reminded of just how important it is to look for other modes of transit. And so I'm, I'm hoping that what we do see and very quickly is, is more of a normalization and equalization uh, by design, because all of us are equal in our needs and our desires and our dreams globally, but it's design that's going to deliver the equity. Yeah. And, and, and Georgie, are you looking forward to the dual uh, challenges of creeping technology and dementia? In well, the you know, um, but you know, it's really interesting. I mean, it's a question for, for you to, to go back to you, Patty. I mean, you know, just to be able to have you here and your wisdom is just absolutely extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I was listening to something this morning and you were talking about sort of like high tech, high touch, low tech, low touch. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, often the sort of like the innovations that you hear about that people are sort of getting excited about are all tech driven. But actually, you know, I think you, you talked about sometimes actually all we need is that human, that human touch. And I suppose the question for you is what is the balance between technology and human connection? And, you know, how, how as, <laughs> Um, innovators, we can sort of like work around that. Well, you know, um, again, it, I think it's, it's quite a good thing that COVID um, is at the forefront right now for designers and design thinking. It was over a year before I had a proper hug. Now this is unhealthy on so many levels, the psychology, the sociology, but just the, the tactility, um, you know, our skin is our largest organ and the fact that we weren't allowed to touch one another safely for such a long period of time. Again, people such as myself living alone, it was my sister who I first felt safe in hugging. But even then we both knew that, goodness, one of us might be carrying the virus and um, she's a cancer survivor. So the thought of getting my sister ill is something I can't bear. And, and, and so I think, what I, I walked away with initially was I'm making myself cry, just the heartbreaking imagery we were seeing globally mm -hmm. of elders pressing their hands and their faces Absolutely. against yeah. stained glass with their loved ones on the other side of the window, confused and wondering in the, the care home where they were meant to live only because the design of our homes today don't support people when they have those physical and psychological needs in late life. Um, the confusion of, of wondering why their loved ones weren't with them. So this, you know, how does AI deliver a hug? Mm. Um, you know, the robots we develop are going to have to have that kind of connection. It won't certainly be the same as hugging my sister, 
but um, just having uh, a machine that's warm to the touch and maybe soft and pliable to the touch yeah. is going to be essential. Um, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty, but too, if, if this machine is meant in the very near future to transfer me from bed to toilet, to bath, to dress me, you know, to clean my teeth, to comb my hair, um, I want it to be as humanoid as possible. Mm. And, yes. and, and for those of you who know me and know me well, I've said over the years, none of these marshmallow men, you know, robots that we're seeing ready in the market today will work for me. I want Johnny Depp as Captain Jack as my roommate. <laughs> I know. I love that, Patty. Honestly, I'm, uh, yes. I quite, I, I'm you know, holding like, out for Johnny. Yeah, but you, can do two, you can have two of those. I'll have, I'll have one of those yeah. two. So that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. But there's a market out there for that robot. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, but it is. But it is really interesting, though, isn't it? This sort of like you know, the, this whole that this whole idea that technology should be the driver. My whole view is that technology is a support. I mean, as you've always said, we've got to. It's all about the person understanding, mm -hmm. um, not not just fixing a problem, but helping people thrive. It's about sort right. of seeing, you know, seeing. It's about desire and joy and all those kind of issues and that's what's so wonderful about about the work that you do you know it's you know it's about empathy real empathy isn't it well you know decades ago we were working with with bell communications and we we um it was it was the first design team to look at things like call waiting features on telephone it was, these were landline features um or missed call information you know where you dial the two-digit code and you could find out who had rung while you were on a conversation. And we did come up with a visual phone call. And this, this was back in the 80s. And it, it got poo-pooed and it was tabled. Um, but I was really disappointed because I saw a whole industry coming out of it where you would have these false uh, facades that you could put up. You know, you called in sick to the office. And so when the, the office rang you to see how you were doing later in the day, you could have this image of you, you know, coughing and sneezing um, come up on the screen because they weren't live. They were going to just be live photos, if you will. Um, and, you know, we played with all the nastiness that goes with um, people being exposed by technology. You know, what about the spouse that wasn't where they were supposed to be, all that sort of thing. And I, I think it's interesting that when you look back four decades, we thought that technology wasn't going to afford us anything as consumers, wasn't going to be a helpmate, was going to be more of a problem. And maybe social media has proven that to be true. I don't know, we'll take that on another day. But what if we hadn't had Zoom through this pandemic? Mm -hmm. Imagine the mess we would be in today. Businesses would have collapsed even more so if we didn't have this lousy way of, of communicating. I hate this so much, but at least it's something. And, and so, George, that's where, where I'm coming from with technology doing, doing the driving now. I really want to push um, technology as far as possible so we can glean through it and toss aside the things that we know at face value mm -hmm. are problematic, but really try to promote the things um, that are just so essential to our well-being. And I'd, I'd be interested just to ask you, because uh, it's an interesting observation that you know, social media and, and texting was always more popular than video calls. When, when yeah. phones could first make video calls, nobody wanted to use them. And um, yeah. one of our colleagues was actually, I think, design director at Orange when this was all happening and, you know, selling us the text. They did text by mistake, they did, just because they could. They didn't think anybody would use it, just it was easy to do, so they did it. Um, but they all thought, you know, the, the future is sort of video calls. And nobody wanted to do it. It was just too personal when, yeah. when you just want to talk to somebody. And certainly, you know, you know, and I'm, you know, I, I've got a young daughter, 23, and they're very much, you know, natives when it comes to texting, social media. But there is still that one step removed, you know, yes. from actually either getting together or video call. Although, yes. although this this pandemic has forced us all to do video calls and we're now much more fluent with it. You know, so is this a journey or given the choice, would we still want to keep those interactions kind of one step removed other than people you're actually in a room with? Well, I've always um, struggled with wondering just what my mother can see from heaven. <laughs> is she omnipresent? Is she really watching me 24 seven? And that of course gives me pause. That said, uh, Big Brother is watching, uh, and and I think it becomes more and more important for that feature in my life as time goes on. 
I rather like the idea that technology will alert my loved ones or the first responders that I'm not stirring in the morning. And the, mm -hmm. and the reason might be stroke. I might have suffered stroke in my sleep. And the sooner you get to me, the better the outcome because the medications we can give mm -hmm. you in the event of, of suffering a stroke um, only last within a certain or are effective in a certain window of time. Past that, you're going to struggle with the need for physio and paralysis and loss of speech and all these other things. It's, it's rather remarkable, it's a miracle in my mind that if, if I'm found to have stroke um, while I'm dining with, with you um, at the Gore column, you can rush me to hospital. I get my injection and in a few hours I'm dismissed. I, I can yeah, go home yeah. and I'm perfectly fine. But we also know the outcome can be quite the opposite. Yeah. So I don't mind Big Brother in my home, noting that I'm not stirring, noting that I left the fridge door ajar, um, or that my front door is unlocked or even open. Yeah. Um, I don't mind any of that intrusiveness because that's for my safety, that's for my life safety. And uh, it's what a smoke detector currently does today. You know, yeah. Hopefully it saves us in the night if there is a fire. Um, so I think when people are made to really feel comfortable with the presence of technology, it becomes very sensible. But what's frightening is being exposed. And, and that's really the tipping point that people don't like the idea that, you know, I've just told doctor that, um, oh yes, I had five servings of fruits and veg today. <laughs> and what I had was an apple pie. Yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> You know, so um, with, yeah, with a smart fridge, they're going to know precisely what I ate because the fridge is telling them what's in the house. And so it's going to have, it's going to force me to stay honest. And, and quite frankly, as we as we mature in numbers, in age, um, the the should do's become the must do's. So that's an interesting point. What, what tips somebody so from from should do to must do? It reminds me of that Douglas Adam quote who, who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that humans are unique in the animal kingdom um, by their ability to learn from other people's mistakes but equally unique in their disinclination to do so yeah. um so, so what, you know, yeah because people know they should have walking sticks or yeah. some sort of hearing aids or have these these detectors so the technology is absolutely there to warn your family if you've fallen over you know yes. what, what pushed my grandmother into a car home eventually was she couldn't get out of the bath she got into right. the bath and had a bath and couldn't get out and spent nearly 24 hours in a cold bath before one of her daughters oh. came to find her and then yes. it was but even then she wouldn't you know she was kind of tooth and nail as if nothing had gone wrong in her system you know yes. so why are we so disinclined and, and george if you've got that but why, why are people so disinclined to do the things they need to do um, to keep themselves living independently, healthier, happier for longer. You want to take that, George? I'm happy to. to no, no, the, no, I want to listen to you. I mean, I've got some oh, thoughts. Okay. But just, well, yeah. It comes down to self-concept, and that's a very fragile thing. Um, and I think, and, and I hate having to raise the current politics, but here we are. It's, it's a global phenomenon that a quarter to a third of our population in the world is hesitant or defiant to take a jab, uh, wear a mask. And, and so we must, as designers, take that on as our ultimate challenge. How do you change someone's mind? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the tough stuff. If there's something that keeps me up at night, it's this. But it's also why I get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> because we have to find a way. You know, I, I went back to the National Archive at the Smithsonian and found photographs, brilliant photographs from the 1918 flu epidemic that took my grandfather. And, and there was a, a segment of the US population at that time, I don't know about the world, um, defiant about wearing masks and having rallies and, and saying, won't wear a mask and showing the police, you know, taking them away and it's just ridiculous behavior. And that's what it comes down to. How do you design behavior? At the same time, you've heard me over the years talk about the need to design for dignity. And, and they're really quite the same thing. Yeah. We are, for some reason, stepping on some people's self-concept of mm -hmm. independence, of autonomy, of defiance, whatever, however they're defining their insistence that they don't have to follow science 
and medical technology and governmental rule. And, and I think we shouldn't be berating them, but we should be giving them that kind of squeeze and embrace that says they're there. Here's the reasoning, here's why. Give them a sensible answer that they haven't heard as yet. The reason people are defiant in the face of change is not because they're inflexible, it's just that we haven't quite given them the right tool to be flexible. Mm. And, and that's what we have to take on now. It's why are some people racist? Why are some people intolerant about religious uh, beliefs and faith? Why are some people unable to see love is love? And these are the matters now for design as never before. Design has become a political agenda, a social agenda more so than it ever has been. Ageism, racism, all of it, it's, it's all the same thing. It's a bias, it's a confusion, it's a demoralizing feature in all of our lives. And, and I think it is quite true, you know, they've always said that the, the best of generals uh, don't eat a meal or a morsel or put their head down for a rest until every one of the troops have been tended to. Um, and that's, I think that's what we all have to do today as designers, we're the force for change. And as long as one of us on the planet doesn't have the understanding and the awareness and the belief system, then our job is to help them make that decision. Yeah, well, I, I, I and I totally concur with everything that you say, Patty. And you know, I mean, I, I, there's a, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to paraphrase it, but you know, I, mean, I use it in every, nearly every single conversation I have with anyone, and it's, and it comes from your, from, you know, from you. Design can enable us, or design can disable us. Um, we, we are not disabled. Design disables us, and, um, you know, and it's been such a. a, a a mantra of of how how I I think and like all of us I think you know around uh, you know um you know the, the three of us here and the people listening we've all had a family member or a friend who has been disabled by design I mean I think about my mum um who had a fall I mean she she passed away two years ago but before that had a fall we spent thousands of pounds buying all the items in the house and all that kind of stuff which she refused to use because she felt that if she was going to go down that journey that she would lose her self sense of self and when she did start using that kind of the the the, the stair lift and all that kind of stuff and the walker all of those kind of items she lost a lot of her sense of who she was and she started to give up and and I think a lot of the design especially around aging is around um fixing a problem not helping people thrive not people not 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 not, not understanding how we can empower people delight people make people feel that they are still valid and I think that there is a very very different way that we we have to think about design and you know and I know that you know Patty, from your you use empathy. You've always done that. It's about putting yourself in the um, the boots of the the end user and the community which is around that. And I think that's very very important. And I think and there's something which you know you, you've always talked to me about is that when you get the top of the top person, invariably a man, it, the top um, in a business, putting you know putting their empathy hat on and understanding what the reality of someone's life is, they have a fundamental shift mm. in that moment because they can see the problem, not from a business perspective, they can see it from a humanity perspective. And I think that's really, really vital. I really do. And I, I, I think, I mean, I'm interested um, in exploring where your, your empathetic design approach came from, because I think this is something that all of us can learn something from you. Um, wh wh where did it start, Patty? Where did your, 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 your empathy design journey start? You know, Colin, you said something a bit ago that, that got me flashing back to sitting at the kitchen table with my gran um, and being the eldest um, child in the family. You know, my grandparents lived with us. Um, she was always uh, having to give me some sort of task to keep me out of her hair. <laughs> and, you know, so I'd been placed at the table to make piles of 10 
green beans for some reason, you know. So I was doing my counting exercise as a little girl. And, and I, I recall her going to the fridge and I heard this painful squeak. And when I looked up from my counting to see that it was my grandmother now taking her hand away and putting it under her other arm and literally sort of drifting out of the kitchen, you know, almost without touching the floor. Um, and then I ran for my mother to say something had happened, something was wrong. And my mother entering her bedroom and hearing the two women speak. And then my mother came out to finish the meal. Uh, my grandmother's arthritis had gotten so bad that she couldn't even grasp that handle on the Frigidaire and give it the proper tug. Uh, you know, it was, it was quite a task um, mm. back in the day. And it, it caused her such pain that she left the one, the one role she had in our family that brought her daily joy was making the meal. Because, you know, not to, to tell you more about mommy in heaven than I need to, but she was a miserable cook. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> when we saw her at the stove, it was like, oh, where are the Rice Krispies? Um, you know, there's, no crime. there's no crime about being Yeah, about yeah. She knew it. She knew it. She's, she's hitting me on the head right now. But but my point to you, Colin, was you, you brought up this um, necessity by design that we, we give consumers choices. And if consumers don't have choices, they have no control. Mm. They have no control of how they feel, mm. their wellness, their health, their, their lifestyle without those choices. And sometimes they're economically driven. They're always design driven. So it wasn't grand as you said georgie it was it was the refrigerator that was quite wrong mm -hmm. it wasn't her she hadn't failed but the branding at the time and sadly still today i can't believe that more than 50 years later i'm still seeing globally the struggle with the branding of age and its relevance and its definition in our lives um, we're still blaming the consumer if they have an incapacity to do a task that Absolutely. we have engineered and designed yeah. And until we get over that, until we take away that that schism, that terrible, um, you know, failure to recognize we are prejudiced in that view it's, uh, it, it, until we no longer hear the word disability in our, our daily language, God forbid, handicapped, um, feeble, yeah. retarded, all these terrible nomikers that just drive me crazy that people use in yeah. boardrooms all over the world. Um, that's the issue. We have a branding problem with aging. It, it is and a, definitely aging and design. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a project that George and I talk about quite a bit about doing a little bit of work internally on the brand of age. You know, yeah. so if you say to people, you know, older person or elderly, images come to their head and lots of words. Right. Any brand, whether if you say Coca Cola or Ford cars, you know, images will come to people's head. I want to know who put them there. You know, who is it, who is it that decides yeah. that being older, whatever that means, which is usually 15 years older than you are at this minute, but um, being older, why suddenly all these attributes are stuck on somebody who is, you know, 74% more likely to have no severe difficulty doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, so, but why are all the brand attributes to, to getting older so negative? Well, and, and half the planet could be defined by what they can't do or mm. can't do well. Yeah. And, and, and so it, it has been said, half the planet yes. is disabled. If you are wearing specs, I'm sorry, you're technically disabled. If you need hearing augmentation, if you need that stick, if you need help getting up from the chair, you know, whatever you need physically, emotionally, cognitively, that defines you as distinct. And like, like snowflakes, no two of us are alike. So I, I've always been just baffled by how this, this happened, but there, there you have the polarity that's with us today in politics. This polarity has been with the human race, it seems forever. Yeah. That said, it doesn't define us. And certainly designers can challenge it better than most. And, and to the point of empathy, I think, I think being raised with my grandparents in my home as a young mm -hmm. child gave me that breadth of experience and observation that how could I not be moved by the needs of granddad, you know, who was injured in World War I and as he aged, lost more and more mobility until his final decade when he was using a chair and he found that heartbreaking. And yeah. yes, 
he pushed sensibility and he pushed that envelope and he fell out of the chair frequently in the first year that he was using it. But then he stayed put, but emotionally he also stayed put. The chair yeah. design was mm -hmm. miserable, miserable. George, you know, I, I was struck by a car in New Zealand in um, February of, of 2017. So for six months, I was um, made to, to learn to walk again. And I'm actually sitting in the wheelchair that I decided to use. It's, it's uh, Bill Stump's errand chair. And I deliberately moved from the wheelchair that they gave me from hospital to Bill's chair because it, it, I just, I found it much more capable of zipping around the office and in, in my home. Um, but when I got to that transition point at the lousy little six inch step down to the pavement at my front door, I hit the mountain of yeah. a barrier, yeah. you know, so that needed to, to have something else happen to it. So that was the design flaw. So I essentially became a prisoner in my own castle. Um, but I would give, I would grade this CASA about a 90% usable. I always go well beyond accessibility. Accessibility doesn't tell you much by design. It's usability ultimately mm -hmm. that we have to be looking at. Um, yeah. So, you know, all these things, the empathy, the control, the choice. This is the brilliance of our lives by design. Mm -hmm. And consumers have a right to expect us to give them an answer. Even that one snowflake deserves exactly what they Absolutely. Um, George, I just, something we haven't actually talked about this, uh, that, that Patty's picked up on that, you know, historically multi-generational homes were probably much more common. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly, you know, spending more time with your grandparents was more, more common. Um, and I'm wondering, is, is that that lack of contact with, with grandparents when you're younger is one of those things that results in this lack of empathy and this, this segregation of society? Oh, I, I, I absolutely, totally agree with that. I think, you know, when you've got age silos, you know, which, which we do have, you know, like retirement communities or, you know, there, there are towns like cities like, like Manchester, which, you know, the average age is so much lower than rural communities. You, yeah, you don't see, you don't see people who are different, you know, in, 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 in age. So what, what do you rely on? You rely on the stereotypes. And if you think that, you know, we're sort of bombarded with between about five and 10,000 images um, every, every week, and, and the majority of those around aging are negative, of course, you start to fear what you think is is the other, which is which is older. So, you know, as soon as you start sort of like getting those sort of changes, which do happen as we get older, you start to fear that because you think before you know it, you are going to be in that care home, isolated, not loved, not seeing anyone. And it is all based on fear. But what is really, I think is really exciting now is that, you know, so much more emphasis has been, it's been put on intergenerational projects and communities and how Housing. And actually, what people will start to see again is that it's not that our age which are connects us, but our values, our needs, our interests, and those are age agnostic. And then you start, you start to see, you, you start seeing people for who they are. Because I don't walk into a room and say, "Hi, my name is George. I'm 53." That is the least, the, the least interesting thing you know, a, a part of me, but unfortunately at the moment, because we do have this age segregation, that actually we we see age as the definer rather than who, who we are. So yeah, I, I think, you know, the more contact we have with people of different ages, the more realized that we have in common, not only the joys and the values and the and the desires, but also the challenges, you know? You know, I mean, in the research I've done, it's not just older people who go to a restaurant and find noisy bars and restaurants irritating, all ages do. So actually, it goes about what Patty was saying. We're, we are disabling people by design. It's not the people who are the problem. It's the designers who are creating those problematic kind of um, environments and products. Given, given that, uh, and again, this, I'm going to further this one at, at, at Patty, you know, you started looking at inclusive design 40 years ago. I mean, the Royal College of Art has been uh, studying and practicing and talking about inclusive design for 30 years. I think it was our anniversary this year. Um, that Roger Coleman and, and Jeremy Morrison first started talking about it and coined the phrase. Um, and, so think, and we're still talking about it 30, 40 years later. You know, how long are we going to still have to, to have these talks about inclusive design and making our society more inclusive? Or is this just going to be an ongoing challenge forever, Patty? 
Well, again, I think we have to go to historic headlines. And, you know, I, I was um, coming of age in the 60s. I remember just pitching a fit and in tears that my parents wouldn't let me take the bus ride to Washington, D.C. to be part of um, the march with Martin Luther King. Um, and when he gave his marvelous speech, uh, um, you know, in the whole fight for racial equality. Um, and, and, and so here we are today, Black Lives Matter. You know, how is it possible mm. that we don't have equality and equity? And, and the point is, we just don't. And, it, and again, it gets back to the ultimate design agenda of not making everybody the same, but giving people um, the truth and the sensibilities and the values and the ethics and the morality that says a person is a person and we can't challenge that. You know, here you're watching the headlines in our courts. We're having very um, trying times with trials now uh, with people who have been killed because of the color of their skin. I mean, is it, is it 1860? Yeah. You know, you, you, you really have to wonder, are, are, why are we still lynching black men from trees? Um, it's, it's really the sadness of the human animal. Colin, you, you said it so beautifully at the start, you know, the, just, just the complexity of us is really frustrating. But at the end of the day, if we haven't at least taken these challenges on, if we haven't, you know, by design confronted them, with another vantage point, mm. with another choice, with another tool, then we failed, you know? So we can't give up. We have to keep pushing forward. We, we have to keep trying. You know, when, when my career began, I was told to my face and in many cruel and vulgar ways that I was taking a man's job, that women didn't belong in this field. Well, my mentor at the time was my boss, Raymond Lowy. Imagine, if I wasn't in that position, I know how lucky I am. Um, getting back to your question, Julie, yeah. about empathy. Um, we all of us are on a life path that's very distinctive. And the uniqueness of that life path is, is giving us all these opportunities and challenges, but ultimately responsibilities. So, I mean, I, what if I had just made a fuss and kicked up my heels and left? You know, um, I didn't. I stayed on and, and I just kept focused on what was important to me in my head and my heart. Um, I'm always reminding design students, I don't care how smart you are, I wanna know what you're thinking, what you're feeling. Yeah. Um, let's start there. Yeah. And, and if there's any reparation that needs to be done, let it be there. You know, We can fix the facts and, and all the detail later, but if you're not coming from a starting point of empathy and openness and kindness, you know, where has the kindness gone for kindness? Yes. Um, these are the simple tools that lead us to those choices that give us the control. Yeah, can I, can, can I, I, I think there's something really, really uh, fascinating about what you were saying about, you know, and go back to Colm's question, you know, 40 years on, what has changed? But, you know, there's something that sort of actually keeps me motivated is that, as Gandhi said, you know, change moves at a snail's pace. And I think sometimes I wonder whether our egos get in the way that we want to be the one that fixes it, you know, as, as designers, but actually that we are part of the process and that actually to, to, to be less fearful of having to come up with the final solution, that we are just part of the process, the relay race of passing the baton, pat batting on to, to the next generations. So does that give us a bit more freedom to actually um, act from our heart and our and with deep empathy and kindness, because it's not just about our own egos? Does that does that does that make sense, Patty? Yeah, it does. And, and again, I, I, I don't want the younger members of the audience today to feel that there is no hope. There's been such tremendous change. Again, look at women in the workforce, look mm -hmm. at women in politics, maybe not in this country, but there you have it. Um, and look at, look at a uh, column, I'm certain you changed nappies. You know, my dad didn't, <laughs> that, was, that was not man's work. Fatherhood has changed dramatically yes. in the last several decades. Um, womanhood, personhood is ever evolving and changing and it is being driven by design and deliberateness. 
But I do think the one thing that, that has changed significantly in these 40, 50 years that I've been working, um, we have to be more political. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think we've, we've heard ourselves talk about the fact, imagine in the Oval Office today, if we had a designer or an architect or an engineer, how different the body politic would be. Absolutely. And quite frankly, the only reason President Obama was managed to give us the Affordable Care Act was because we now have so many people in the Congress, in the Senate, who are doctors, yeah. who started their careers as doctors. And, and so they brought a sensibility to the table that wasn't there. So, and I'll just finish on this note. I've always said, Noah had it right. You have to have two of everything on the ark because you know, what would you leave out today? Who, who wouldn't be invited to the party? And what would the sensibility be in that? Trying to come up with a, an idea for a concept, a service, a product today by a corporation, by a government, um, without including every citizen, every person on the planet is absurd. And that's what we still unfortunately continue to do. And so, yeah, I, mean, I think that that's what we say that, you know, the, the world, the world we live in might not be the kindest, most inclusive world possible, but it is certainly better than it was 40 years ago, yes. I think. Yes, um, most uh, definitely. And I, I started my career as a retail designer or commercial interior designer. And in those days, there was no designer on the board. Um, and even even when uh, people, you know, heads of design started happening in retail organizations, client organizations, they weren't designers. They had no real knowledge of design. You got the feeling they were the last one in that week when they were handing out the jobs and they got design. Um, mm -hmm. So there's no empathy to designers and what we were trying to do. But but that has changed. You yeah, know, we have boss. chief design officers now, yes. along with the chief executive officer. And that's significant news. Yeah. And, and so, it's very powerful for us as a tool. And so very optimistic that that can be gotten to politics as well. And we used to have a design minister. I don't know whether we still have a design minister in the UK, but we certainly used to have a design minister. Um, I didn't know. Did, did we have one? I didn't even know. Yeah, you oh. did. You did. Yeah. In yeah. fact, President Clinton tried to do the same thing. Right. And that was poo-pooed. And, and um, he, he had a design summit right, right after he took office. Yeah. And I have to imagine Hillary would have... Uh, continued it, made it even better. But he had to conclude it because essentially, I think the Congress, you know, sent down an edict from the Hill saying, we don't need no damn design. Well, <laughs> this is the United States of America. What are you people talking about? But it's back to that, you, you know, forget inclusive design, you know, politicians don't understand design. Never mind, right. you know, the, the minutiae and segmenting it into inclusive design or, or accessible design or different types. But again, hopefully that, that was changed. You've been talking quite a bit about race and gender. Um, in terms of inclusive design and, and at the Helen Hammond Centre here where we are moving our um, inclusive design thinking not away from age and ability but to include race and gender as well and no doubt eventually it will include religion and social, uh, sexual orientation that inclusive design is a rather more generic term would, would you agree with that or, or would you be oh out? most definitely because sadly again um, the scales are tilted here so a black person who's also an elder consumer is dealing with uh, a poor level of health care, a poor um, access to food, transportation, reasonable housing. There is such inequity and bias and prejudice at play uh, in the open market. So these are matters for design. How, how do we create that balance of those scales mm -hmm. so that um, you don't have an elder forced to walk to a corner shop you know, where they just get packets of chips and, and things for their food, um, you know, a loaf of stale bread, but they, they can go to a proper market and, and get fresh veg and, and fruit and stop eating those apple pies. Who, who will do that? <laughs> I can't imagine. No, but in all seriousness, if you, again, you, if you don't have choice, you can't have control. And sadly, quite a large number of us don't have enough choice in their daily yeah. lives choice is, is a big issue can i can i ask a question because i know there's there's quite a few young um really sort of empathetic designers who are who have, who have come in to to to, to listen to, to to you talk what what um what can you share to them? What 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 skills should we be developing? I mean, it's something that that we were talked about a couple of weeks ago, Patty, about that the designer being the politician, designer being the peacemaker. 
so the, the role of the designer is becoming so much richer, isn't it? I mean, what kind of skills do you think, you know, we should be learning, um, learning and definitely sort of like up and coming designers? What, what kind of skills should they be uh, going out there to develop? Well, I think we, we have to be the principal party in a meeting that humanizes the discussion. Yeah. And, and, um, and sadly, there are things I can do today as, as I'm about to hit 70 that I even wouldn't have tried at 30, right. you know, because I would have been shown the door. Yeah, but yeah. let me share them because I think there's a place for them. And I think what we've seen in the change of the workplace um, most definitely is embracing this sensibility. And that's coming into a meeting with a platter of home-baked cookies is a dirty dog trick, <laughs> but it's one that I've used often, you know, because it forces the most evil contrarian amongst us, <laughs> you know, who came into that meeting to say, I'm going to tell this crazy blankety blank B what I think of her idea. And then he's, he's munching on my chocolate chips, which are fabulous. <laughs> um, and how can he be that angry with me, you know? So if you yeah. can just lower the temperature and get everyone on the same page. Yeah. And so speaking to each other on that human level is essential. Yeah. I do my homework before that meeting. If I'm in a city, I learn all about, you know, their sports team. Um, and I see the headline that they lost the game last night. Mm. And so when I come into the room and I'm always right there at the start, I'm, I'm the early bird, I'm not running in late. I'll say to the first fine fellow who walks in, oh man, can you explain the officials to me? I mean, what was that about last night? And then he's off and running. Yes. <laughs> and it's humans. Yeah. Well, and he sees me as a sensible, reasonable female suddenly, you know, and that that's the great equalizer. So people will say, oh, well, that's dirty trickery. No, it's not. It's it's being human. Absolutely. It's really putting this yeah. on the level of a first date. You know, we should be putting some effort into this. You want to, yeah. you know, put on a proper outfit. You want to make sure you, you know, you look your best and, and you want to speak properly. And the only way to do that is to do a bit of homework. And for heaven's sake, with mm -hmm. Google, if you can't look up some basic facts about the people you're meeting with, shame on you. <laughs> you know, so these are, these are the sensible things to do. Um, and, uh, and the other, the, and let me, one more quick one. I always make it personal. Um, it's not just that I'm Irish, that I'm a storyteller. I always go for the jugular. I find out, Colin, that you have a daughter who's coming <laughs> of age. And I know that you're a terrified daddy because I had a terrified daddy being Don't tell her that. Don't tell her that. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, so I deliberately go there. And yeah. I, I will I will deliberately say, Tom, I see your 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 baby graduated yesterday. How are you doing? You know, and and it's a moment where the poor man will be like, oh goodness, how did she know that? But then he wants to tell me. Yeah. And that's the importance of it. Because if we're not able to speak on that human level, how can we talk about the grandiose nature of the design at hand? Yeah. So I would say those would be my top three. Oh, they're things. wonderful tips. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Yeah. Just yeah. We, we've just over 10 minutes left, and I'd like to take some questions from the audience. Um, so quite a few have, have come through, so we probably won't be able to get to all of them, but I'm going to uh, read out one or two of them um, and put them forward. And I'm going to paraphrase a bit, uh, see if I understand them correctly. But I've got a question here from Nico McDonald, um, who has made a couple of comments about the digital world. Um, and increasing the focus on usability, user experience, et cetera. What do you think, you know, if, if, again, Patty or, or, or George, what's the one thing that you would do to make these, you know, more positively, so that they could more positively affect older people or people who are more infirm? Well, we stop calling point. them infirm. Um, <laughs> we'll deal with you later, young man. Exactly, yes. <laughs> I noticed that as well, Colin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, I think the quickest fix is you must, 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 as you do at the RCA, work with the end user, you know, work with the yes. broadest array of users. I still am stunned to see all these sorbet colors being used on websites, you know, that provide such low contrast visually for a person of any age with um, some issue with reading print. And then you add the cognitive dimension of trying to understand what they're reading. 
and seeing too much vernacular used and uh, just assuming people know where the magic place to push is so that the, you know, the right um, image comes on screen. We, we make terrible assumptions on, on a consumer's ability to use the technology because we were born to the technology. I'm speaking for younger designers now and we use it every day. And we forget that some people on the planet are just now getting a phone mm. and it might not be a very smart phone. And so um, I think we have to work with as, as broad an array of end users possible so that we can find those, those weak points in our, our final design. And they are many. Excellent. And so this digital dilemma is one of exclusion and the only fix for it is inclusion. Yeah. And, and I, I would totally agree with that. I mean, you know, I mean, McKinsey did that report um, a couple of years ago, didn't they, about the value of design. And it's incredible how many of the, the and these are big businesses who do not design with, with end users at all. I mean, you know, and I worked with some of them and it is incredible. It's often an idea which comes up in a boardroom. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. That, that would work for X, Y, Z. And they do not spend that time actually working with people of different abilities and different ages and different sexes and different, you know, it's just incredible. And with that little bit of hot, extra hard work of actually observing, listening, finding out what people really want, then they wouldn't make so many bad products and services and they would make more money. You know, it really is quite simple that it with really good, heartfelt, empathetic design, not only can you make um, more money for business, you can make a more connected society. It's a win, win situation. And, you know, Patty, yeah, by design, by design, by design, it should be, we should go to sleep with it and we should wake up with it. It really is. It's key. Well, we have to stop designing for the elderly and just start designing for usability. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's the umbrella, quite yeah. frankly. Any silo is going to, to leave someone off the boat, you know. Because, and, because um, no one sees themselves as older. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, just, this is the crazy thing. You say a product is for someone who is older. I, I don't see myself as that. I don't see myself. That's not for me. But if it's going to make my, if it's easy to use, it's like, honestly, you know, the OXO grips. I mean, you know, we, I defy anyone who doesn't love them, but they are designed for desire and usability. You know, it people... was it, ultimately the dignity of design. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, that's what we have to come through. And I won't be happy, Georgie, until I get you to the point where you're standing on the rooftop screaming your age, because <laughs> it will, it will have, nothing but positive meaning you know I, oh, I, geez, would, the thing I is, would, I'm, okay I will tell you I'll tell you all this is what 53 <laughs> and a half looks like it's great right well yeah. I deliberately when I'm with the younger person um now we're getting back to some kind of you know getting out of the house um my server yesterday at, at the lovely restaurant at our art museum here in town came to the table and we got chatting and, and she was talking about her upcoming birthday and I said well you know, all next year I celebrate my birthday because I'll be 70. And, and I believe in the year long celebration if your age ends in a zero or a five. And she was standing there with her jaw hanging open. She said, you're 70? And I mean, I won't be happy until that's not the response. Exactly. Yeah. It's meant to be a compliment, but it's not a compliment. It's not. You're absolutely right. Because this is what it, this is what, that's what 70 looks like. This is what 53 looks like. This is yeah. the reality of it. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go to another question by uh, Ren Scott, uh, mainly because it starts with, I love Patty's optimism. So I don't know whether oh, you know thank Ren. You. But, um, um, but therefore, I'm going to pick on the least optimistic aspect of the question, which, which, which is just to challenge you. So it, it's referencing the pandemic. What is the, your least favourite uh, thing that you've observed during this pandemic? Stupid people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I promised myself today I wasn't going to be judgmental on that level. But yeah, um, the, the frustration for me is, you know, couples who dig in their heels and one won't apologize and both won't say we're equally responsible for our relationship going down the toilet. Um, that's what gets us to divorce court. The fracturing that we have in the world today because people are inflexible. And the very nature of the universe means you must be flexible mm. if you're going to have a happy, healthy life. Um, that, that is really frustrating and irritating to me. But as I've already stated, when confronted with someone who is just so finite, concrete, and stubborn in their position that 
you know, the, the sky is black and, and they're not going to get a jab and they're not wearing a damn mask. That actually intrigues me. I want to know why do you feel that way? I want to know, you know, what brought you to that point? I want them to wake up one day and say, I was wrong. And that is the most difficult thing for the human creature to say. We do not like admitting we were wrong. It's hardwired in us. And if I can demonstrate by design a better path for them, not because of a vanity that I'm in charge by any means, but because I do know that this would be a healthier choice for you, a happier choice for you, then that makes that makes me um, rather joyous. I'm going to I'm going to take another question now, and it's the last question I'm going to really read out on technology because I think we've done that quite heavily. But it's from uh, Gurav Chada, who talks about technology and uh, developing countries. You know, so what role does inclusive design technology come to bear you know for aging communities um in developing countries because it's something we haven't we don't talk about too much well it's just you know you go back to the basics you know someone who's living in the open well we have to give them some sort of shelter and i don't care if that's um you know the leaves from a tree with twigs or an animal hide or um fabric found in a kind of dump that we've cleaned and somehow reused, you have to start with the basics. So every one of us deserves a safe place to, to lay our head at night. We deserve nutritious food and clean water. Start with the basics. I don't care if it's a grand house or a basic home. If it's your nest, it should be celebrated and every one of us deserves that. That's the role of design in the world. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of that lovely project um, several years ago now where they just took the liter bottle from a soft drink or, or water, cut a hole in the, the roof and screwed it in place and, and the marvel of it creating light um, in a dark space, you know, just brilliant stuff. Um, Victor Papanak would have been, I'm sure, applauding from his cloud yeah. in heaven. Um, and, and so this is, this is the kind of stuff, again, this is why we wake up every morning. There's, there's always so much work to be done. You know, Mr. Lowy said at the end of the project, okay, we have to start again. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> the minute the project was done, you had to start again because there was new information. It was a new day. It was a new technology, a new pathway. Designers create pathways. We shouldn't be building roadblocks. Yeah. Absolutely. And so as long as we have roadblocks in the world, there's a place for design. We, we are now, um, our hour is pretty much up. So there is one final uh, question from Ariana for queer, which I'm not, I'm going to respond to, but not answer. She's asked, when talking about sensitive subjects such as sexual health during, uh, during and post menopause, you know, what, what is our advice? And I'm just going to respond to that by saying that we have an entire evening dedicated to that at the Design Museum in March, where we'll, we've got a panel and giving presentations and talking about um, sex and sexual health as you, as you age and how important it is. So do take a look at our website, the Design Age and This Age Thing websites, um, and, and come along to the Design Museum. Um, in Colin, the Colin, may I, may I give a, a, an answer yes. to that? Um, one of the first projects I took on was the development of mobile uh, mammography here in the States. And my first hire was a young man, straight out of university, straight from the uh, Rochester Institute of Technology where I did my undergrad work. And I deliberately chose a male to work on breast mammography because I thought that was one of the biggest pieces missing from that puzzle. Mm. Men are as affected by breast health as women. And sadly, men get breast cancer and it's very rarely detected before they're going to lose their life. But the, the loving spouse, the father, the friend with the woman who is going through a breast cancer is essential. And it's a major piece of an ultimate design for care. And um, so we have to get comfortable with talking about holistically our bodies and our health. And that, yeah, that has no barriers. And, and we must not blush uh, repeatedly when we talk about these subjects that uh, you're and getting I, better, Colin. Getting, getting used to yeah, <laughs> gonna, gonna put a lot of, uh, in March. Right, before I hand back to Brie uh, to bring the session to a close, I just want to say personally to, to 
Patricia Moore and George Lee. What an utter honour it was to sit here and talk to you for an hour. Um, I feel very, very privileged. And um, we must do it again soon, is all I'm going to say. Yeah. And um, cheers to the holidays, everybody. Oh, <laughs> Chin chin. Cheers. cheers. So, uh, Bree, back over to you to close out the session. Hello, everyone. So, what a wonderful session. Thank you very much to all our speakers, to Colm, George and Patty. That was amazing. Um, we have some interesting resources for you. This age thing, which has been mentioned in the session, which George um, has told you a little bit about, can be found here. This is the website, thisagething.co, the Twitter and hello at thisagething.co if you would like to get in contact. Um, the contact details for Design Age Institute are here. We'll be sending these around in the email post session as well. So don't worry if you don't jot these down in time. And we have a little uh, something for you. This is a free download copy of our Design.Different magazine. This is a magazine that's been put together with everyone from the Helen Hamlin Centre um, for Design and the Design Age Institute, featuring work from the centre for, um, for the last year. So the, there is an accessible direct download link, which will be coming your way. Also, we have another event coming up within this season, because if you didn't know, the design.different season is a whole season of inclusive, um, inclusive design events. Our next event is design.wicked, a design-led approach to tackling wicked problems, and that's going to be taking place in January. So do sign up for that. The links are going in the chat now, but we will be sending this around in an email after the session. And here are all our contact details so feel free to take a screenshot or we will be sending these around to you so thank you very much to our audience and thank you very much to our panelists and that's the end of this session <laughs>